Okay, everyone. I'm not sure if there's a session chair or not, so we'll just make a start. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, my name's Salim, and I'm here with Rio, who's been uh, working with me doing a PhD on this strange thing called ILNP, the Identify Locator Network Protocol. So we are both um, net dev newbies, so please be gentle with us. But we're actually here for two reasons. One is to explain to you about what um, ILNP is, but also to get any advice um, and help you can offer on how we can make this available to the community because it's uh, a uh, quite a, a major change to how networking might be done with respect to how addressing is used today. Um, we're also very grateful to our store who have <coughs> sponsored us and made it possible for us to attend here and we're going to have a demo of the code base working later on today in the bits, nibbles, bytes and words session and um, that is the code base that we're going to be releasing in a few weeks time as well that you'll see in action. So, just an outline of what we're going to cover today. So, why ILNP? What's it all about? The core concepts of ILNP, which are uh, a change to the way addressing and naming is done. Uh, and then Rio is going to walk you through how we've implemented this uh, new architecture approach, including the modifications we've made to the Linux kernel. So, clearly in half an hour, allowing time for questions as well, we're not going to be able to go into lots of detail. But when we do the code release, we are going to release more details, including all the call graphs and how files have changed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then later on this uh, evening, there's going to be uh, an experiment showing you a particular application of ILNP, which is mobility, working with ILNP. So where did ILNP came about? So I've been working on ILNP for oof, about 15 odd years now. And it first came about as uh, an academic exercise. I work in a university. And at that time, lots of people were trying to do new things with uh, um, IP. I say new in that they weren't necessarily part of the core architecture functionality like mobility, multi-homing, which can be done today, but all those functions are enabled separately with separate mechanisms which might not always work together. And so um, uh, a colleague of mine and I ran Atkinson, we thought, well, how can we kind of bring this all together? And that's where ILNP came from. Um, and at the moment, it's an experimental standard. Uh, well, I don't think it's a standard, it's just an experimental proposal. Um, and it came from uh, some work we did within the IRTF routing research group, which is now concluded, RFC 6740 to 6748. And on the ILNP website, there are links to those and various other things, including ap academic papers and some results showing how things like TCP and UDP perform as well. Okay, so what are the core um, differences between ILNP and IP? Well, I'm going to take you through really an architectural approach first, looking at the protocol uh, architecture and then look at how we engineered that. So first of all, um, our idea, well, what we ended up with was a realization that the way IP addresses are used today uh, is, is a little bit broken with respect to some of the things we want to do. So instead of having IP addresses, we use something called an identifier and something called a locator. And I'll explain more about those uh, on the coming slides. And really, this came from looking at the way the IP address is used in the protocol stack and realizing that the IP address bits get used all over the place and things get a little hairy when you do that, uh, especially because the IP address is uh, uh, physically bound to an interface. So when you configure uh, an end system, you bind an IP address to an interface. We all do that all the time, we do it automatically. And that means that that address is bound to that point of connection for that host. So if we have a look at what that means for the, the stack, um, if we take uh, the layers and we look at what happens with IP, you get the IP address that's bound to an interface, uh, as I've just shown you. It's used at the network layer for routing and then it's used at the transport layer. It forms part of the tuple that forms the end-to-end um, -end state for both TCP connections and UDP sessions. And then, of course, applications can use an IP address as well. Uh, of course, um, best practice is to use, say, a fully qualified domain name at the application layer or an application-specific naming space. But typically, it's very convenient just to use the IP address. So we saw that that was part of the problem after looking at it for a few years. 
And um, so we decided to have a clean split of the way that that aspect of naming works in the, in the core architecture. Uh, so we introduced two new namespaces, a locator and a node identifier, and I'll explain more about those. And the other thing we thought um, it would be useful to do is not to have the kind of tight, semi-permanent binding you have between addresses and objects in the protocol stack. So there are now dynamic bindings between node identifiers and locators, and dynamic bindings between locators and interfaces. Okay. Um, so you have a node identifier, which doesn't identify an interface, it identifies a node, and it's dynamically bound to a locator, and if that node happens to change location, it bangs to a new locator, and so you have mobility. And if you want a node to be multi-homed, you dynamically bind the identifier, the node identifier, to multiple locators, and you have multi-homing. Okay. And it's all done from the end system, so you don't need any specific support from the network uh, other than the basic support that you expect the network to give, which is routing and forwarding. Okay. So one of the things we, we tried to do quite consciously was go back to the kind of original philosophy of the internet, which is that the core network does simple things and tries to do them well and effectively, so routing and forwarding, and then all the other stuff you want to do, you move to the edge, um, to the end system as far as you can. Okay. So just a little bit more on these two new namespaces, first of all. The uh, locator is topologically significant, so it is used in routing, but it's not used at the transport layer state. So basically, the bits you use at the transport layer are no longer linked to topology, they're no longer bound to an interface, so you have some agility for the transport layer uh, session because the state is no longer bound to uh, some sort of topological set of bits in the network or to an interface. And then we have a node identifier and that is, has no topological significance at all. It doesn't play any part in routing. Uh, and that's the only uh, set of bits that's used in the end-to-end -end transport protocol state. And then, as I said, there are dynamic bindings between node identifiers and locators. Okay. So this all sounds a little bit uh, abstract at the moment. And um, certainly one approach we could have taken many years ago was to look at this in a clean slate approach and say, well, how do we do everything from first principles? But we thought that might not be so useful, so we started looking at how we could build this into FreeBSD and Linux. And so what I'm, uh, Rio and I are going to talk to you about today and demo later is the work we've done in Linux. So if we do a bit of a reality check on this, how do we get this new kind of protocol architecture uh, sh um, shipped as bits across the network, and then how do we change the code in the protocol stack to do something useful with these. So the first part is to say, well, how does this fit on the wire? And we looked uh, very much at IPv6. If you look at the RFC documents for ILNP, you'll see that we've defined ILNP uh, as effectively extensions of both IPv4 and IPv6. So we take the architectural approach and we basically implement it as a superset of either IPv4 or IPv6. So you may see references to ILNP v6. So that doesn't mean we have five versions that were rubbish and we threw them away. That's just ILNP as a superset of IPv6. Okay. And that's really all I'm going to be talking about today. ILNP v4, so ILNP on top of IPv4 is also possible, but it gets really messy and I think pretty difficult to deploy. Okay, so this is um, the essence of what this looks like in a packet. Uh, it turns out that the locator is effectively a name for a network. And so that has the same syntax and semantics as an IPv6 routing prefix today. Now that's really handy because that's the part of the um, 128 bits in the packet header that IP routers use in order to route packets. So basically an ILNP packet looks like uh, an IPv6 packet as far as a router is concerned. And then we have a node identifier which occupies the lower uh, 64 bits of the um, 128 bits in the packet header that would normally be used for an IPv6 address. And that is used to identify a node and not an interface. So it's not bound to an individual interface. It actually is an identity for the node. And nodes are permitted to have multiple identifiers simultaneously and multiple locators simultaneously. They can even, if they like, generate uh, dynamically 
uh, identifiers on the fly to use them for uh, an individual session. In fact, any mechanism you can use to uh, generate the 64 uh, identifier bits for IP, for example, privacy or CGA, cryptographically generated addresses, that can be used to generate node identifiers. The difference is in the semantics, they're bound to a node as a whole and not to an interface. Okay. So today I'm going to hand over to uh, Rio for a short time and he's going to talk to you to some bits of the code base we need to change. There are changes to get adra info which we're not going to cover in detail today but we will uh, include with the code release and that's so that when you um, make a, uh, an access to a fully qualified domain name you pick up identifiers and locators uh, or you go to the DNS and pick up the DNS records for identifiers and locators but what we focused on is making those look um, to anything above sockets like IPv6 so again in the demo you'll see later um, ping 6 and iperf working over an ILNP enabled kernel but they are not recompiled binaries they're standard IPv6 uh, compiled binaries uh, for ping 6 and iperf and they work over ILNP while mobility is happening and, and they seem to be reasonably happy about it um, Ria we'll talk to you about some changes that have been made to uh, socket API uh, and the kernel code, again, there's some changes to ICMPv6, which I'll say more about, have some slides with a demo later on uh, with a bit more detail, and also what's needed to change in the TCP and UDP kernel code. Okay. So I'll hand over to Rio. Hello, everyone. Um, so the main sort of modifications that we, well, one, one, of, the, one of our main goals in implementing ILMP, uh v 6 into um, Linux kernel was that uh, we want to utilize the IPv6 infrastructure as much as possible so that we have the backwards compatibility and the new features side by side at the same time. Um, essentially, so the, in order to um, achieve what we want to do with um, Island PV6, um, we essentially had to um, have the hooks to call for the Island P processing in the IPv6 input and output paths. Um, so, which means modifying files within net, net IPv6, you know, as, um, uh, files within that, um, and so, uh, so on and so on. And uh, input and output, so, so the IP6 input and output both have a um, hooks that calls islandp um, send and um, receive, which modifies uh, what's called islandp communication cache. Um, so that encapsulates the information for ILMP operations in general. Um, won't go into details today, but um, certainly happy to talk about this later on. And um, as, as Salim has mentioned just now, uh, socket, so the struct sock has the is ILMP flag. Uh, SK buff also has the is ILMP um, flag to indicate that this is an ILMP connection so that uh, the uh, ILMP operations can be triggered as it goes through the IP um, and also TCP UDP processing paths. Um, I'm seeing some confused looks, but I I'm sure I'll, I'll be able to clarify as I go along. And obviously, yes, um, ILMP has to have um, its files to do the um, aforementioned um, operations. So um, ILMP 6.c and um, ILMP 6.h is added. Right, so the main challenge in making this work, so then the um, splitting the, um, the locator from the identifiers of the sockets in the uh, transport layer, um, the main challenge here was that uh, obviously the IPv6 expects entire 100, 128 bits to be used as a both identifier for checksum, all sorts of things. In, and. Um, those are the two main things that we had we had to focus on in a um, bit about doing some juggling. Um, I I'd like to stress that um, the top 64 bit, which um, notes the uh, locator, is mutable. It does not matter what what it is as long as ILMP knows about it. And what matters in the context of socket, identi uh, socket identification, so essentially the um, identifiers of the connection between the two hosts. Uh, the bottom 64 bit, which does the um, n node identifiers. So um, essentially what we do in that context is that we, uh, in those two sets of operations, we basically mask the uh, locator 
and we restore them as soon as we're done with those things. So everything else looks exactly the same, except in the context of identifying and checking if this is the correct set of um, um, identifiers to identify sockets or do a checksum is um, done correctly for LNP. That is, once again, if it is an ILNP. So this is why we have the is ILNP flags in um, SOC, struct SOC, and uh, SK buff. So uh, let's start with something simple. So that the UDP is slightly simple in a sense that, um, I mean, datagram is sent, and you know it may or may not be received, but that's okay. You know, it's, 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 it's the, um, it, it doesn't have the state control, right? Um, so if, if the application wants to send, um, this is a very simplified um, call graph. I'm, I'm sure you've recognized that it is. Um, so in this call graph, we have um, essentially three colors of boxes, gray, um, uh, yellow, and blue. Uh, blue one notates the new file, new functions, so it's, it's entirely new to the ILMP kernel, uh, or ILMP enabled kernel, shall we say. And um, yellow is modifications to existing file, existing uh, function. So and the gray one is completely untouched. We have not touched those functions. So when the message is being sent, um, send message calls, which goes to call make escape at one point, which will then calls underscore underscore IP6 make escape. And um, in that, at that point, uh, we check for whether this is uh, sending to ILMP host from ILMP host. And uh, um, we call ILMP6 send in order to, uh, first of all, uh, update the record of f who we're talking with and what sets of the locators and need are used. And, uh, and then after this is sorted and uh, correctly selected in the um, I, uh, header section, it goes off, uh, well, sets, sets the um, destination in source address. Um, what it looks like a source destination source address, it then goes to the send SKB, which once again checks whether this is actually island P6 um, destination and source or not. And, um, and then it does the checksum um, for the uh, ILMP. So that, which basically means that we do not include the locator in a checksum calculation. So we just back them up, mask them, do the calculation, put them back in, and send them off. So as soon as it goes to the wire, by the time it hits the wire, it's going to look exactly like IPv6. But we've en en enabled the um, the socket identification and the checksum calculation when I'm being manner. In the, in the receiving path, um, when the IP6 input finish is called, um, this first of all checks that it's an ILMP um, uh, destination in uh, uh, source, and it, it, it calls ILMP6 receive, which essentially, once again, updates the, um, the, the uh, ILMP ILCC which keeps track of the, um, the locator NID. And uh, in the following, um, at one point, uh, IP6 checksum in it is done, which obviously, you, you, I'm, I'm sure you know that um, um, it does the checksum calculation. So before, this, um, before the actual checksum calculation happens, masks restores. Mask calculates restores. Those that, that, that are the cycles essentially happening. Um, in the compute score, in order to do the socket identification, so, so the, uh, the when you do address comparison, once again, locator is masked so that we only check against the NID. And uh, UDP6 e hash fun, once again, hash calculation. So we need to do mask, calculate, restore. Those simple cycles. So that's how UDP is received. So this is how UDP is done. And um, it seems to work quite well. And moving on to TCP. It gets a little bit um, complex. Once again, this is overly simplified. I'm sure I've, I've skipped a lot of um, functions that are uh, essential. Once again, uh, in the context of ILMP, those are the essential functions that we had to modify. So yellow boxes, once again, are modified. Gray boxes aren't touched. Uh, blue are the new file and new function. So once again, um, e fun. so that's the, um, on, on the on the left bottom, that, that's the hash calculation, backup mask, Restore, and uh, on on the far right we have the uh, send message and uh, TCP current MSS. So those two are modified because ILMP um, have additional optional headers for ILMP nonce, uh, which 
we have the explanator. Uh, we have an additional um, option, so we have to account for that in in setting the um, um, MSS. So the TCP send message checks for it by calling is island p6 um, and then flags it the the socket to be uh, is island p socket and TCP current MSS actually adjusts them. Now uh, TCP send check that's another checksum. So we we do the checksum calculation and uh, in IP6 XMIT, so at the, that's at the bottom, we, before we send them off, the segmentation length is actually adjusted again. So that happens um, at that point. And also p 6 send is called in order to do the IOCC updates and setting the correct uh, uh, source and destination. I'm running a little fast because I think I'm running out of time here, but um, this is how we receive the TCP. Um, once again, when it comes in, um, it does the mark and lookup um, of the ILCC via um, ILMP6 receive in IP6 input finish. And then it gets passed on to TCP v6 receive, which does the um, checksum in it. So the SKB checksum in it before that mask um, calculate restored. And uh, INET6 uh, lookup established and e -hash, e hash fun. So that's once again lookup and check some calculation, so that's modified. Um, TCP v6 send synac on the right, uh, left bottom, sorry. Um, that one um, is calls the um, um, underscore underscore send check, so then before that's called, it needs to have the um, L64 mask again. And on the right bottom, TCP con requests, once again, we need to mask them before we call the TCP v6 con requests so that we don't include the locator in identifying the socket. Um, that we're dealing with them. So uh, I'm running out of time once again, so I, I'm kind of rushing through, but I'm happy to um, answer questions towards the end, and I'm gonna hand this back to Celine. Right, so the, the demo you'll see later on today tries to show this in operation, so the location and identifier working with a particular scenario which is end-to-end -end mobility, so mobility done without any tunnels or proxies or middle boxes, just done purely end-to-end. -end. So what we're going to have in our setup later on today is uh, six kind of small desktop machines. They're all running um, Linux, but some are running uh, Vios. So the ones marked R1, R2, R3 are IPv6 only machines running Vios, acting as routers. And the uh, blue boxes with white text, um, those are the only ones running ILMP. And what we're going to show is that there's a mobile node marked MN talking to a correspondent node, CN. The correspondent node stays where it is. And the mobile node moves between networks. And as it moves between networks, we're going to show a ping running and IPERF running. And um, you'll see we run, we'll run IF top. And you'll see that there's a handover between those um, different networks, but the flow stays intact. And in fact, what happens is that ILNP does something called network layer soft handoff. So basically, in the overlap region between the two networks, it's multi-homed in both of the networks, and so you get pretty much zero gratuitous packet loss. You do get some misordering, um, but it means that you can have handoff without packet loss. And in the paper that accompanies the talk, which eventually I think ends up on the NetDev website, you'll see we have some, uh, just some lightweight performance figures to show you how that works. And you'll see in the UDP graphs that there is no loss during the handoff, that it just carries on, that the flow just carries on straight through as it goes across the network. In the TCP at the handoff, there are some system and buffering effects that we notice on this test bed when we moved it, uh, the code onto the test bed about a week ago, but we didn't see it on our main test bed, which was in, uh, on some rack mount machines. So I think that's a system level issue, which again, we're gonna look at before we release the code in a few weeks time. Um, but it pretty much does work. There's, there's no loss, but there are some buffering effects for TCP. Um, again, you'll see links to various papers on the website and other TCP um, uh, performance evaluation with an older kernel, 3.9 kernel, and you, you don't see those artifacts for TCP. Um, that's all I'm gonna say for now, so I think we still have time for questions. What about um, 
check some offloads. I don't really understand how it works. It, at the moment, it doesn't. You, anywhere that a checksum is calculated, you have to modify the checksum calculation. So, for example, when we're looking at packets on the wire uh, and we, we have a PCAP file and we look at them with something like um, uh, Wireshark, it says all the checksums are bad. Wow, that's a huge, huge... <laughs> Well, certainly if you're doing offloads, yes, you, those need to be modified. In fact, what you do is you zero out the locator, run the checksum calculation as normal, and then put back the locator bit. That's the modification that needs to be made to the checksum. So it's not a big modification, but I agree with you that anywhere you compute a checksum, you're going to have to change it. There was another question somewhere. Um, so a couple comments. On the checksum, <clears throat> why do you need to do this? Because you're sending a packet, it looks like an IPv4, IPv6 packet, or I guess IPv6. It has a source and destination address, so as far as the network's concerned, it doesn't care what those bits are. Just, I mean, unless they're changing, you, you'll, get this, you'll get the same checksum. And the other reason to do that is there are devices on the internet that are going to try to validate the checksum. So they're going to be dropped. Um, but more generally, can you go back to the slide that showed the mods? Which one? Uh, the one with all the yellow boxes, as many as possible. So I think your goal, if you want to... Um, that's got more yellow boxes on it. That's a lot of yellow boxes. So your goal, if you want to get this um, accepted upstream, is to minimize the number of yellow boxes here. And in some cases, I think it, it might be kind of um, easy. So for instance, the IP input, we already have um, an NF hook that we use, for instance, in ILA. So hopefully, you won't need specialized code in the IP input for ILMP. Just call the existing hook, and we just need to populate the hook. And that way, um, it just works. Now, the TCP and UDP, those are a little um, more worrisome. Um, we have a resident TCP maintainer here. I don't know if he's going to be too happy if we're, we're putting special hooks in to just do a, a different type of socket, socket lookup. Um, and also, there's another obvious part here is UDP and TCP aren't necessarily the sum total of all transport protocols that the kernel supports. So what about TCP, SCTP? There's potentially a long list, tunnels and things like that. So again, I think the goal that you, you probably want to have um, in development is to absolutely minimize the number of the amount of churn, the amount of invasiveness, and that would give you the best shot to actually get this um, upstream, I would think. Okay, so several questions there. I'm going to try and answer them. First of all, uh, why not just use a checksum as it is? Because the locator is immutable. The locator can change on path, and we totally allow that for various things. Again, I can go into them. So, well, for example, so, so, for so multi That would be fine, but if the locator changes on path, just update the checksum. Or uh, even No, but the, then that would require changes to the middle box, the box well, in the middle. So, th But there, there's another option here. Or you can do that trick we did in ILA, where if you, if the locator um, changes, let's see, somehow we need to offset that. Okay, so, so but if, if you're changing the locator in flight, the middle box is already being modified. So whoever changes the locator should update the checksum somehow. Right. So th there, there are, at the moment, what we're focusing on is hiding ILNP from existing applications. So IPv6 applications work as they are. The eventual goal, for me, is to have ILNP aware applications. So knowing that identifiers and locators can change, and that would require uh, changes to the sockets API and for that information but to be available. And in that case, you don't need to worry about that as much because that change is end-to-end -end visible. But, but what's happening at the application or at the checksum should be completely independent of the application. All the checksum is, it, it just has the pseudo header that includes the IP source and IP destination. Okay, so if you... You, if you calculate the checksum over those and if somebody wants to change those like a NAT, it's their responsibility to change the checksum accordingly. So we already do all of this in other contexts. No, but if you, if, you change the, if you change the checksum computation, which locator bits would you use for the correct locator? So you'd use one set of bits when it's sent. And what would you do if the packet happens to be multi-homed and is bound to two locators? So 
having the checksum not tied to the locator, in my view, is the correct thing because then you have an end-to-end -end checksum only and it's tied to bits that are stable for the whole of the transport layer session and so you have end-to-end -end integrity for the checksum. But that's not an assumption of checksum. The, the assumption of checksum is that it is a checksum over the bits as they are sent on the wire. And if, if, right. if okay, somebody, so again, if, so, if, if okay, the so address we're, we're stuck is on that one that, topic. Uh, we're stuck on that one question. You've, got, you've asked other questions. And okay, I'm, I'm so go to the more general. I think the but, second question is more my, serious. But my, my understanding of the checksum is it's an end-to-end -end checksum. So you want end-to-end -end integrity. No, because of NAT, that's broken. Uh, no, but the, you'd, na, it, it works with this. It has to be correct so end broken, to end. But it's broken with NAT, but it works with this again because you don't need NAT. Well, no, actually, it's not broken with NAT. NAT works. Sorry? If, if NAT did not update the checksum, the internet yeah, but, would but, fail. But NAT breaks the end-to-end -end integrity of the, of the transport layer session. It's what? You, you have different addresses at each side, so you yes. don't have the end-to-end -end integrity of the session. Yes, and, the and that's, fine. that's fine if you want to restore the addresses at the end point. But on we the should, wire... We should, talk, we should talk later, I think. So, so I think the simple rule is on the wire, if the checksum's incorrect, that's going to cause problems. Checksum offload. You're going to have intermediate devices dropping packets. Um, I, I just f figure out a way to keep the checksum correct. I think your life will be a lot easier. Yeah, I think we're being on the problem. Yeah, we're, we're just too far, and, and checksum is too well known to be to be modifying it at this point. Any other questions? Can you explain in high level cells what are the differences between ILNP and ILA? Right, so the main difference is really that IL, uh, ILNP is purely end-to-end -end, uh, and doesn't have the kind of control plane that ILA has. So certainly Tom will be able to tell you more about uh, ILA in terms of the control plane. But in order to make ILA work, you need these ILA routers. And with ILNP, you don't. It just works over standard IPv6. Um, you need new DNS entries, but DNS is already globally deployed and it's supported um, for, so you can you know, set up ILNP uh, NID and L64 records uh, with an ISP and they'll just, they'll just work. So the main, um, I suppose the main difference in terms of practical aspects is in terms of deployment, you just update the end systems that you want to run ILNP and they should work modulo the discussion we've just had about the checksum. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, we seem to have taken more than our allotted time, so my apologies to the other speakers.